Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Morgan, for the introduction. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I've already seen a lot of uh, colleagues and friends uh, around, uh, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you guys. So today, I would like to share with you my views on uh, hydrogen and the opportunities and challenges associated with its uh, deployment at scale. I'm sorry about my voice, but I've had problems these last few days. So our overall research question can be summarized by the title of the presentation. Basically, is there a pot of gold at the end of the hydrogen rainbow? Throughout the presentation, I would like you to keep in mind the three key insights that won't come as a surprise to you all. The first one is that hydrogen could indeed play a key role in the carbonizing energy system, including hard to abate sectors, but innovation and partnerships are going to be key. The point that Nadine made before, it's very true. If you think that 80% of the cost of deploying new energy infrastructure at scale is covered by the private sector, partnership between public and private will be key going forward. Despite the universal access to renewable energies, geopolitical and market dependencies in a low-carbon world are still going to persist. They're just going to be different. And finally, it's key to remember that the geopolitics of renewable hydrogen will be comparable to natural gas, not renewables. So we will have regional markets, well, we don't even have regional markets at the moment, but they will start as regional markets, so a bottom-up approach, and ideally, they will become international and global. But we will see the same challenges that we've seen with natural gas. Now, you see here, I talk about renewable hydrogen, and the point that I would like to make from, from the beginning is that unless you are an incumbent in fossil fuel, it doesn't make any sense to look at anything else but renewable hydrogen. Hydrogen produced by water spritty through electrolyzers using renewable energy. Because let's talk for a second about uh, blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen, uh, to deploy blue hydrogen at scale, you actually need to rely on the deployment of two infrastructures, so you double your risk and your challenges, the one for CCUS and the one for hydrogen itself. So, um, my group, uh, my team looks at, uh, at whether in a low carbon energy world, as I mentioned, uh, and there will be a more uniform access to energy of all, or all dependencies will perpetuate and new ones might emerge. We use an analytical framework and a mathematical model to model how basically where country, regions, and stakeholders are today and where they want to be in 2030, 2050. And we use this uh, to basically provide policymakers and other stakeholders with the means to make informed decisions on policy instruments, uh, technology innovation funding, and long-term investments in enabling infrastructure. Oops. Okay, so you probably have already seen this. This is more a reminder to me on why I'm so excited about hydrogen. Uh, as you all know, hydrogen is a staple, has been a staple in the petrochemical and refining industry for the past 150 years. It touches every single sector of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of energy. Uh, we have had many waves uh, of interest in the past uh, about hydrogen. The last one was in 2000. We all know how it ended. But at the time, there were two main issues that are different now. The first one was that uh, hydrogen was uh, being considered for the mobility sector and uh, mainly for light-duty vehicles. And uh, already in 2000, the development and deployment cycles of battery EVs were much farther down the innovation cycle than hydrogen. The second key difference is that in 2000, the cost of renewable energy was much, much higher than today. So for someone like me that has worked his entire career in the energy sector, hydrogen basically gives me once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to 
think about designing and deploying a scale new energy infrastructure. One point that I will make more than once during the presentation, we need to do this in a way that we don't replicate the same mistakes and the same inefficiency or fall in the same traps of the past. So if anyone had any doubt, and I think I did mention this slide actually, uh, about the fact that we are having a hydrogen momentum, uh, the investment pipeline, uh, direct investments, has grown, grown to 320 billion US dollars. Uh, we have more than 1,050 projects, uh, up from 680 something less, uh, a little more than a year ago. Now, the important thing to keep in mind that these are announced projects. So, are they all going to be sanctioned? Probably not. And you might wonder, is this good or bad? And uh, until recently, I thought it was bad. I'm now convinced that it's actually good because of uh, another challenge that I see facing uh, the deployment of hydrogen at scale, which is the subsidies. Um, I fear that we will see a first mover competitive advantage that might create similar market asymmetries and distortions that we've seen in the past. But I'll talk about this a little later in more detail. So here, two things to, to move, other things to look at. Europe is still leading the race, the hydrogen race, but North America on a year-to-year -year basis has been the one with the greatest increment, mainly due to the Inflation Reduction Act that we will talk about in a second. So, uh, don't laugh at the slide, I actually did it myself. I usually don't do them, uh, so it doesn't look very professional. So, there is no doubt there is an unprecedented momentum, but uh, there are uh, key challenges facing deployment of hydrogen at scale, mainly due to cost, scalability, and public perception. And uh, here you can see we have a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, infrastructure availability, long distance shipping, water availability, uh, carbon intensities, uh, public concerns, leakages, uh, markets, we don't have any hydrogen markets, and cost. Cost has been the main one up to now, especially when it comes to, to, to green hydrogen or, or renewable hydrogen. And to all of these, uh, I would actually add now subsidies. And it might sound counterintuitive, but I'll explain why I think it's a, it's a challenge. So, as you all know, uh, once we produce the hydrogen molecule, the molecule is the same no matter the process. The difference in the process is, uh, depending on the uh, feedstock that you use, uh, uh, are basically, in the end, uh, the carbon intensities associated with the, with the, the hydrogen molecules and uh, the cost. Here is just to give you an idea of, uh, of the cost uh, for hydrogen production in China, uh, split by fuel cost, OPEX and CAPEX. And as you can see, uh, renewable hydrogen is still more expensive than, uh, f than, renewable hydrogen, than uh, hydrogen from coal, even with the carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, this is true almost uh, everywhere. So to address, uh, to address uh, the cost uh, challenge, uh, countries around the world have started to provide subsidies to the production of, uh, of green hydrogen. In, uh, in the US, we talk about uh, carbon intensities. In Europe, we talk about colors. But the concept is the same. How do we make uh, uh, renewable hydrogen, which is the only one that has uh, a carbon intensity of zero, well, together with pink hydrogen, hydrogen from nuclear. But then the key question in my mind becomes, are subsidies now winning the hydrogen race over the underlying economic fundamentals, over resources potentials and efficiency? Are these uh, subsidies going to create uh, unbalances uh, that we've seen in the past? Uh, market distortions. So let me show you with some numbers what I mean by this. So the Infl Inflation Reduction Act has introduced uh, production tax credits for 
clean hydrogen, so, sorry, for clean hydrogen production. And uh, you can see in the table there on the bottom uh, right uh, that uh, they go depending on the carbon intensity, the kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen, they go from 60 cents to $3 per kilogram. Now, the, the dynamics that we're already seeing is that, uh, let's take again uh, blue hydrogen uh, as an example. Uh, blue hydrogen, even with a 90% carbon capture factor, which is high, uh, can only get a $1 per kilogram uh, incentive compared to the $3 that uh, green hydrogen, clean hydrogen will get. And so the result is that uh, we, we fear, I don't know if I should say if we fear, but the cost of production of green hydrogen could become cost negative in the US by the end of uh, the decade. And we have already seen this. We have seen uh, something like this uh, with the renewable energy. When incentives uh, in the United States were allowing uh, renewable energy producer to bid negatively into the grid uh, to get their electricity dispatched. So basically, because of the incentives, uh, there was this huge market dis uh, disruption where you could pay the grid operator to get your electricity. And this has created issues with uh, other technologies like nuclear that could not cycle. So the, the, the point then becomes that while subsidies can uh, significantly accelerated the deployment and, and, and adoption of new technologies, in this case, uh, hydrogen, they also risk creating what I mentioned before, a first mover competitive advantage at the expense of uh, the underlying uh, economic fundamentals. And uh, so this is a scenario which no one really wants, where <laughs> basically there is a rush to build a, a projects that, that without subsidies don't stand a chance uh, to be economically competitive. And so an uncoordinated subsidy race, uh, race would be much, much more expensive, and I'll give you some numbers in a second, less effective, and I have two examples. And so it's going to be key to have a system level analysis in which taking in consideration the key underline uh, resource potentials and efficiency, <coughs> sorry, to do our analysis and to determine which are the best uh, opportunities to allocate capital, public capital, which by definition is uh, finite. So, and only in this way, we're going to be able to avoid falling into the inefficiencies and the traps of the past. So let me start with some numbers before I give you two, two examples, which, by the way, you can imagine by the picture what they are. Uh, so the first, as for numbers, we finished a study for the European Union on the future of, uh, of uh, green hydrogen in the EU. And uh, we assumed, uh, I'm just giving you this as a reference, we assume that by 2050, uh, the EU demand for green hydrogen will be about 75 million tons per year. Basically, today's global demand. And uh, we looked uh, at uh, what would have been the cost of uh, deploying the most efficient and most cost-effective uh, hydrogen infrastructure for the block. Now, the fact that uh, I'm talking about being cost-effective, it won't come as a surprise. We were trying to replicate what has happened with natural gas uh, and uh, see whether there would be dependencies similar to Russia in the case of, uh, of, of uh, renewable hydrogen. Now, the cost of deploying this energy, hydrogen infrastructure at scale, if member states, uh, which they are not, where to work together to build the most efficient one, it's about 2.3, 2.4 trillion US dollars. If every state goes uh, by itself, it's going to be two or three times more expensive. And, all, and with this, I could rest my case. So two examples of, uh, of how a regional approach to the deployment of energy infrastructure has created the key issues in markets. One is natural gas in Europe. Um, 
as you know, uh, natural gas here in Europe, uh, as was de deployed the infrastructure by national ch champions, the ENI, uh, the Total, the BP uh, here, uh, and others. They never had a system uh, a view, a European system view in mind, and the inefficiency and the added cost of this uh, became a stark reality when the war in Ukraine started. In the US, uh, we have something similar with the grid. Uh, uh, I say the grid in the US, it's an oxymoron because it, we don't have a grid in the US. We have a patchwork of, uh, of state grids uh, that don't even interact with each other. 